Okay, great. So our speaker today is Michael Gates. Michael has been with the EEG for the past year or so, but before that, he's had uh, quite a, a varied career from uh, being a FPGA specialist to importing stuff from PubMed into web wiki data and uh, working on all sorts of different uh, uh, software projects. I think the thing that the, the as his bio says anyway is mostly been working on things that try to make a difference in the world and is particular for trying to improve connectivity in, in rural Africa with the NGO project. Uh, and worked a number of different um, projects here with Intel partner based startup companies and so on. And uh, he's sort of the core team for getting our ideas from 4C to the world. So he's going to talk about programming for the planet based on, I guess, his more recent work on, yeah. the, on this. So thanks a lot, Michael. It's all your business. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think the way I usually try and summarize is I, my, my goal is always to do myself a job. Right? If I've been successful, at the end of whatever I'm doing, I'm no longer needed. That's kind of, for me, a measure of success. Um, and I think what I what what I'm gonna walk through here is where I see that is impossible, and that 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 I find is something that needs to be fixed. So, so this book is um, not gonna be like a bunch of the usually age books, and I'm not I'm just in, like there isn't paper here, a grand result. This is. Reflections on spending like the last year or so working on a couple of projects with ecologists as a kind of embedded uh, kind, of, kind of computer science person in those projects. Uh, I'm going to kind of run you through the projects. I think the projects are interesting and look at where the kind of friction points from a computer, like why do they need a computer scientist in the first place to, to be in there, right? That's, that's the kind of the question I think you should be asking. And in reference to the can I just walk away now? And, and unfortunately, the answer is like I think no. There is a lot more computer science to do to to um, enable people in these areas. Um, and the challenge is repeatable and repeatable computer science. That's that's the trade I should cover. Uh, these slides are for me, not for you. Uh, <laughs> uh, a few weeks ago, I came across this paper, which I found was a great lens for sort of this thinking. Um, it's a uh, myths and myth conception by Mary Shaw. Um, it's a long paper, as you may know, from the page count to the top, so 24 pages. Um, there's a bunch in there. Some of them agree with, some I disagree with, but it's been a great kind of way of putting structure on this idea that lots of um, like people try and use computers to achieve their jobs, and like. You know, we see them struggling. That's kind of why, like, if, if you've been helping an ecologist from a computing perspective, you, you'll you'll see that. And it's kind of um, how do you how do you kind of reason about kind of what's going on there? And uh, then, if you don't want to pay for those, a podcast version, you try to pay within three hours. Um, so you know, choose yeah. your poison. Um, but in, in the early on the paper, it has this table which I which is kind of presenting the myths of. Um, the kind of this sort of programming language is kind of thrown on paper. So it's kind of the, the preconceptions that people have when designing programming language systems and the reality as, as presented by Mary Shaw is kind of like uh, to counter those. And one of the things I found really useful was this idea of a vernacular software block, which I love. Right. So these are these are people who are domain experts trying to do their their job. I have to use software development tools to get that job done. So we see this all the time in the CCI with ecologists writing like R scripts, Python scripts to try and analyze data. Um, I got a friend who's a civil engineer. I often ask to listen to kind of like like how you've been fighting Python to get stuff done. But these people are not kind of weak software engineers, right? Which is the kind of a trap that I think is easy to fall into. They are domain experts in other domains, just trying to get something done. Um, and, and, and that's why I like this term vernacular software developer, because it's a, it, gives, it gives me a kind of thing on which to hang all of the, all of the thoughts. Um, reproducible, comprehensible, usable, visible, scalable. These are all attributes of the kind of systems that we're, that the, in ecology, we're in 
environment side with these are the properties that we want and these are the things that I find hard to achieve to the tooling we got. Again, the slide is mostly for me to remember these words. Um, so yeah, so, and, and kind of to give this some credit, so the ecologists are trying to save the planet, right? The planet's in a bad way. These are the domain experts trying to get us to a better place. The science that they are doing should be influencing decisions that we made to help implement you know, things that will improve the planet. They are really important, but the tools make the foundation on which those results generated feel to me somewhat uh, uh, kind of shaky because I kind of like the tools don't support kind of the kind of rigor we, we, we would hope for from, from that work. And it's not failing as an active software engineer. I argue it's a failing of the tools that we as an industry have provided. And as a kind of concrete example, like this is the kind of fake the child that we've got in, in the group of the, the Barra report from earlier, uh, from, not earlier this year, from last year now, um, where a lot of the science behind a bunch of carbon credits was kind of Barra wanting. And it's like, like how do we avoid falling into to, to, to similar traps? And how do we make tools to got that? So I'm going to walk through two projects that I've worked on over the last year. Uh, one is a kind of backward analysis of, 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 of environmental interventions, and it's a forward looking analysis. And in both, I'm going to like look at where the pain points were from, from a kind of computing side. So, the first one is um, the tropical moist forests um, kind of assessment work that I've been doing with Patrick here uh, on the computing side, and it's kind of on the ecology side led, led by Tom Swinfield. Um, and this is trying to assess the impact of forest interventions. So tropical moist forests, hopefully I don't need to convince this audience, are important things. Lots of biodiversity, lots of carbon storage, and we should be trying to protect them. Um, people do projects to either say restore forest or try and prevent forest loss. Are those projects any good? Right? That's that's a, a question we should be asking. Um, now, in the Vera Guardian example, that's because they were meant to be backing carbon credits, and it's like, did, was there enough carbon? And like, but it's also just anything, any intervention, right? You want to know, did this actually help? Can I copy it somewhere else? Is it is it is it a good thing? Or should we be trying something else? So, this is an, uh, uh, work that's attempting to assess those interventions. Um, and so this is where we get to look at the pretty graphics, hopefully. Um, so the way the the uh, the the kind of methodology that um, Tom has put together uh, involves this process of counterfactuals. So let's, let's walk through it. Uh, we got right. So what we're looking at here is Sierra Leone. So this is the West African coast. Um, on the kind of bottom right, um, bottom right, we have uh, Liberia, and that kind of dark splodge down here. This is the Golden Rainforest. Um, and here, just inside Sierra Leone, we have this marked out grey area, and that is a an example of a project that is trying to um, prevent forest loss. So they're working with farmers to promote more sustainable um, farming techniques while ensuring that they get paid. Um, as, a, as, as the alternative would be, say, they farm palm oil, which would require removing the forest, which would be uh, bad. So, they're doing this. So, how do we work out if that thing works? So, the, 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 the method uh, following colleagues have put together is to use, try and find points around that historic, have the same physical characteristics and have the same historical characteristics up to the point the project starts. And then you follow those counterfactual points forward in time along with the project and see that is there more forest loss outside than in, for instance. Uh, so we do this. So the, this is what these lines are. These are kind of what we refer to as kind of matched pairs. And um, so points outside have been assessed on do they have the same elevation, slope towards the sun? Are they similar kind of biome type? Um, and then looking at land usage history, 
Um, so this project started in 2012, so going back a decade, all of the points here had similar land kind of usage up to that point. And then we're able to kind of look at these and say, um, there we go. That's kind of hidden behind uh, this. Can I move this? Um, we can place a little left pause landmark. Hey. Um, and so you can kind of see here, there's kind of like this green line is the in the project, and the blue is the kind of broader ecosystem. You can say, yes, there was less kind of forest loss in the project than outside it. Um, then you also have to do a similar analysis for what's referred to as the kind of leakage zone, um, so which is kind of a extra zone around the outside of the project, because you know you could have gone to the farmer and say, please don't cut down these trees, and they're like, yes, no problem, and then turn around and cut down the tree, and then they think that they make a good software engineer you know, because they follow the specification. Um, <laughs> so, um, so there's kind of all of this, and it's there's a lot of data in this, and there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, it's expensive to do these computations, right? It's, it's like, I can rattle through how to do it quite quickly, but actually crunching numbers for a project, like we're working at a resolution of like satellite data at um, 30 meters uh, per pixel of the equator. Um, and, um, you know, we've got many, many layers of, of data, like the elevation, the slopes, the access, we can track access to healthcare as a proxy for human uh, habitat focus. Um, all of this data builds up and assessing this project from cold, I think is like a day or two to pull in the raw data. Um, and for, um, we've got like one project in Brazil that takes like two weeks to do the assessment part. Right? So this is, um, kind of heavy, heavy work. There's lots of data sources, and uh, yeah, it's you know, it's 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 uh, it's kind of interesting from that point of view. Uh, so where are the friction points? Like where where do I I kind of struggle with this? I think very much this. So this is Google Earth Engine. This is what Tom was using uh, to do the kind of early implementation of this methodology. Google Earth Engine is, is a very powerful tool. It has in it a bunch of data sources, like all of these kind of um, satellite images that, that, that we're using. Uh, it lets you write in like Python or JavaScript, it has some libraries, so you don't have to worry about concurrency and parallelizations. It's really neat. Uh, but it has some, some drawbacks when it comes to like reproducibility uh, that, that we kind of wanted to avoid. So Google Earth Engine is a closed proprietary thing that Google own. Um, these kind of assessments of uh, projects, like you know, we're looking back decades, but we're looking forward decades, and we want that science to be scrutable and reproducible and reassessable for many years to come. Like Google have a habit of closing down projects that aren't their core business. Kind of on a semi regular basis. So there's some nervousness around that. Like, we don't know it's going to go away. It's, you know, we hope it doesn't, but we can't rely on that for long term. Um, there's also kind of other data sources that Google have imported and made available to scientists, which is great. Like, again, like, I totally see this as a generally a positive thing. But we found when we tried to move the methodology out of Google Earth Engine, that those base sources often had been cleaned up, made better, which is notionally good, but the, the methodologies by which they've been cleaned up and made better were not public. And so we had to either replace them with other base sources, or we had to kind of take a stab at how they you know, average a couple of layers or whatever. Um, so we think it's kind of like that. Um, on one hand, this is great because it's an enabler of, 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 of ecologists to do something that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. But in that term, of can the, the kind of results be accessed? Like, you know, Google may block me from accessing, right? There's, there's no guarantee that I, as an individual, can get access to this tool. Um, although it's not fair, there's no guarantee that I, as an individual, can access a computer power enough to do this. So, you know, I, it cut both ways. Um, but that's kind of that's one one thing. So we we decided to step you know, so we were pulling this out of Google Earth Engine, 
not because people were eventually bad, just because we were we had these concerns about not the other. The another example of kind of friction point we made, we had um the one of the key data sources for this analysis is the EU Joint Research Council published this data set on land usage over the tropical forests over the last 30 years. Good. Plus, it goes back to 1990. And it's just a high resolution. So the images that say, is it forest, is it deforested, is it really growth, what have And um, this is public, it's, 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 uh, we, we, we downloaded it, it's, 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 we're using it. And at some point we had a, an issue where our results didn't match Tom's. So Tom's been doing this before we started. He's got some results. So when we were in the team, we were just trying to say, if we, if we match what we're doing yet. Um, and we spent ages trying to work out why our results were different. And it turned out that, so every year the, the, the JRC publish a new version of this data set. And um, not only though do they add the, the latest year, they incorporate new findings, right? The, the satellites don't say forested, deforested, whatever, right? They're, they're running some software to take a bunch of primary sources and generate this layer. And over time, they will improve those methods. And what it turned out is that Tom downloaded the data in like 2021, and we downloaded the data in 2022, and just they improved our algorithms. So they reclassified a whole bunch of data, uh, pixels as. Um, uh, as as kind of regrowth where they hadn't been before. Let's see if this works. Uh, right, so there's so this is the date for the year 2020 as downloaded in 2022 versus it in 2023. And like without going into too much detail, you can see there's quite a lot of change in that map there. And this data isn't publicly versioned. There is no indication, like from looking at the file or the URL which you access it, that this has changed. This is like, but this harms reproducibility of science, right? So if you happen to have cached a different year from, you know, from me, we cannot generate the same results. And the old data is not available. Like the JRC only published a current release. And I'm not trying to get at the JRC here. This is, you know, versioning is kind of something we in computer science deal with all the time, but I imagine most people, you know, struggle enough to do this, like take this data, get it out there because it's a big data set. The idea of having 20 versions of this terabyte plus data set is probably kind of hard for them to, to think about, but it impacts um, the ability to make reproducible science. Um, and then finally, this, this image, this uh, image Patrick generated both the last slide and this one here. Um, this map, which is Sierra Leone, yeah, this is a difference between um, a slope of calculation. So we took an elevation map, you can take a, a map of elevation points and generate a slope of map, right? So you're measuring the difference between heights of the pixel. Um, this here shows the difference in at the elevation map is generated between uh, GDAL, um, uh, the kind of main popular geospatial library version, frequent two and frequent three. Like if you happen to have whichever version you had installed on your system, you'd get a vastly different uh, result. Um, whether you're aware of this or not, like, you know, um, it's not something I would think to check. Maybe, maybe you would, but I'm yet to see any kind of published um, results um, in geospatial papers which list specific versions of which specific libraries they had installed on their computer when they happened to run the, uh, the experiment. Um, and that just makes it hard, right? This kind of, I, most, most people here know, I, I look after the kind of, this big servers that we've got here, um, like Sherwood and what have you. Upgrading the GDAL version is a real pain in the neck. Um, right, I did it once and I broke something for a bunch of people and I've been too scared to touch it since. Um, some people will run it in a coffee container and like, to get a more recent version. But which, you know, what's changing between those results if they run it natively or against the like, version, right? 
it's hard to figure out. Okay, I'm gonna leave that project there. Um, the other project I've been working on is the kind of uh, light metric, which is an attempt to look at um, the impact on biodiversity to land usage change. So, say you take a bunch of land and you think, well, I'll restore it to pre human habitat. Kind of, you know, I'm going to take this deforested area and return it to forest, or I'm going to take this farm and return it to whatever it was before it was a farm. Is that, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Right? This, this, this is trying to generate data to so people can make informed decisions about that. It may seem like, well, like restoring farmland is to, to what it was before would be a positive thing, but there are lots of animals that over the last hundred or two hundred years have got used to living in farms and they would be negatively impacted by it, uh, by that. So it's, it's kind of a tough, tough call to make. <clears throat> Uh, so this work, kind of, I worked primarily with Alison um, uh, was was trying to come up with data sets to let people make these these more informed decisions. This here is a very pretty map. I uh, this is an example of the outcome of this. So this is the map for the impact of biodiversity if you converted old land to arable. The like. And the idea is in each pixel, like if I converted that pixel to arable, what is what is going to happen to the, the what is the cost of biodiversity? And what you can't see because this is just pretty colors is the place this will be negative, right? Because converting land to arable will mostly displace biodiversity. And there is a kind of alternative map which is kind of restoring to pre-natural. Uh, it's a kind of it's a it's a kind of fun map, but Behind it, it's a very simple uh, methodology, which is why I like this, this kind of metric when I'm playing around with, with things. Um, the way the, the biodiversity maps generated is we take the data from the IUCN Red List. So the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, they maintain this list of uh, endangered species, and they publish a uh, bunch of metadata and what's called a range map, which is what you can see here. So that's the area in which you might find this animal. Um, and for each of these species, we calculate what's called an area of habitat, which is kind of a more refined version of that range. Um, it's a relatively easy to understand uh, algorithm, I think. So it's a certainly well documented and kind of um, there's lots of literature in, in the domain about this, this methodology. Um, so you'll take a range map, you can imagine turning that into a, a map that is Boolean, right? Animal can be here, it can't be there. You know, no, it can be here, it can't be there. Here. Um, um, we know the elevation range from the metadata, so we can take a high resolution elevation map and work out, oh, here are the valid points where the animal could, have, could be found. And we take a habitat map, so people generate maps say, this pixel is boreal forest. This picture is Arctic tundra. The pixel is Arctic tundra or whatever. And so again, you can imagine turning that into a Boolean map of uh, the habitats that the species would like. And then you just add them all together and you end up with the area of habitat. It's nice and simple to express, but where it falls over is just scale. Um, there are 40,000 species on the IUCN red list. The rasters that we're using are at 100 meters per pixel at the equator. So there are 150 gigabytes per layer. Uh, we needed four layers per AOH map um, times 40,000. And that would read what I was brought into this project was it was taking a long time to calculate. Um, and like the scale is just large, right? You, we have servers that have like a terabyte of memory, which when I started it, just seemed insane that I had access to a computer with a terabyte of memory. Just like really crazy. Um, and just this workload, as simple as it is, humbles that computer, right? Because a terabyte of memory, you can load six of those maps, right? If you're if you're not not clever about it. Um, and to be clever about it requires you start to understand the computer architecture, right? Like, like. It's not just load map, do some spit out. I have to start thinking, well, you know, I've got this much memory. Actually, if I'm using a smaller area, I can load just a portion of the map and then I can kind of tessellate 
several species running at once and what have you. Um, the, the kind of standard tooling like GDAL and what have you, you know, don't automatically do that juggling for you. Uh, you want, it is a burden on the user of these tools to, to, to do that. Um, even when you do try and be clever and shrink them down, like most animals, take up a small amount of room on the planet. Uh, and so you think, hey, great, I can run like a, dozen, a couple of dozen of these at once. I'm, 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 I'm prepping through this list. And then a moose comes along. Um, moose and bear take up most of the northern hemisphere in terms of valid range. There aren't many of them, but the places they could be is quite broad. So it's about the northern hemisphere. So it's 75 gigabytes. So you've got this, this thing ticking along where it's using like, you know, five, 10 gigabytes, and then suddenly, bam, the, the moose is in your pipeline, and then the machine goes down because you ran out of memory. <clears throat> and it's stupid, mind-bogglingly stupid. Sorry, I'm gonna get angry now. Um, the, on Linux, the, like, it's, you just, ah, you've got the out of memory killer that comes along. And so if, if, the, if Linux runs out of memory, the next process that asks for memory gets shot. And if you're lucky, that's the next animal analysis that came along, or even this one is current. If you're unlucky, it's a system service. And Linux doesn't care. It's just if you're asking, please don't have some more. No. <laughs> uh, it's like the John Wick of Linux. <laughs> and so I have free time, I've had to ask Malcolm to go and physically reboot Sherwood because this has happened. And it's not the fault of the ecologists, it's just we've made substandard nonsense for them. Um, like, like you know, virtual memory is not a new technique. Uh, being able to fall over gracefully or suspend something, swap it out until there's a huge time, right? There's lots you could do here, but our systems don't do it. Or we put that burden on the vernacular of software developer to drag them back into it. And expect them to be both a domain expert in what they do and what we do. Um, I'm going to rush through this one. We, we wanted to compare all the data to hex files rather than pixels, because hex files have a nice property that um, you can compare them in area, like they have equal area no matter where you are on the globe, whereas most map projections will distort uh, the poles versus the equator. Um, and this, this kind of, again, this grew quite quickly. This ends up being like 2 billion hex tiles for all species for one scenario, and we were doing four. And it's just like, how, like, as a computer scientist, I started struggling with the tooling for this. Um, and not just the tooling, but how do you then kind of visualize the data and kind of work with it? Like we don't have, it's hard to go off the beaten path of using pixels for stuff. And so in the end, we abandoned this and the life metric is done weird in, in the pixel space. But I just think it's interesting, again, kind of like that was a compromise that was made in the kind of science because of the limitations of the, the kind of the tooling. Um, this, is, uh, this is the pipeline. So I said it was quite a simple metric. Uh, like this is actually the end-to-end -end kind of data flow. Sorry, catch up this. <laughs> um, the point is not to see the boxes, just to acknowledge that there are a lot of boxes. The fact that Ketchup is having to kind of go really close to the screen to try to see what these are is the problem, right? It's kind of, or it's not the problem. It is just the nature. Like any task ends up being broken down into small components, and that's fine. But again, software systems make this challenging, right? So what happens is um, we're going to go through the cryptography list of names here. So Alice is working on getting result A, right? She does some work, gets, gets the first step done, and then that goes to Bob. So Bob tries getting the next stage done. Bob can't do it, so he passes it to Carol. Carol actually does get a script working, generates result, passes it back to Bob, and, back Bob, and Alice doesn't know that Carol did the work on it. Um, and it's like, that's human nature, that's how things work, and that's how this works in practice when ecologists are working as a big team, pushing to get a hit paper deadline, right? Things get moved around, swapped between people, and the tools that we have to deal with, and like Git and what have you, which are not, again, friendly to the vernacular software developer, um, kind of are an afterthought. And I'm literally, like Alison, uh, as we went, went, went on maternity leave, uh, after the results were done, but before the paper was submitted, 
And I got people saying, well, do you have a script for this graph? And I ended up having to go into Alison's kind of home directory, look at her batch history to try and work out what script she'd run. I'd hope that it hadn't been tweaked since. I'm looking at file decks. Oh no, it's in R, so she'll run that on Sherwood, not Daintree. And like this kind of spelunking is just like, why? But it's it's kind of like because the kind of all that provenance, like going back to to earlier, like how do we understand where research results came from and demonstrate the the authenticity of the science is hampered by this. This is real world. Like it's not again, it's not slight on the 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 developer at all. It's, they have a job to do, they try and get results done, they're trying to save the pretty planet. But all the tools that we've given them um, make it hard to do that. Um, this, oh, I, this, I, I, this is turning into too much red. This is, um, we later on, we did a, a final extra analysis, which is what happens if you destroy the land in one of these pixels? What does that do to biodiversity overall? And I did, I read, reread the numbers and sent it off to uh, uh, an ecologist for, and she had a look at them and came back and said, um, in these piles where we've destroyed everything, there's an increase in biodiversity. Like, we don't do cockroaches, so <laughs> what's going on here? Um, and I looked, I, I had a panic, because at this point we were kind of approaching publication, and it's suddenly, sort of like, uh, why are these numbers like this? Um, it turned out on one of our AMD servers, if you do a scalar, if you do this particular um, kind of set of uh, operations where we raise a floating point number to the power of 0.25, we get a different answer if you had it as a scale limit rather than an array. Right, so NumPy would give you a different result. And it's a very small result, set by 10 to minus 16. Um, but that accumulates over over many species, right? So it's up by a tiny amount for one species, and then when you add them all up, it becomes a real meaningful number. We chatted to the umpire people, and they were very good and helped us with this, and they said, yes, that's what that CPU does. That's expected behavior, right? Um, the number is sufficiently small. It's below the floating point bounding error for that CPU. Yeah. It's like, it's exactly half, in fact. The, so kind of floating point can't represent every number, right? And so there is a gap between which you have to assume that two floating point numbers are equivalent. Um, this is lower than that, but I say when you accumulate that error, it becomes significant. And you know, it happened on one of our machines, and none of the others. Because when I found this, I said to show it to Patrick, and Patrick it works for me. And that's because his machine didn't have that bug. Um, again, like, like how. How vernacular. Oh, yeah, this was just a visualization. This is what happens when you start summing all these uh, layers together that all looked like they had no error in there, but they would. Uh, you would submit that to some modern art. Yes, no, I, 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 this, is, this is one of my favorite pictures from the last year. Uh, <laughs> we have a, on the local, on the 4C Slack, we have a map, interesting maps channel. And like, so this is kind of like, if you ever have fun maps, submit it there, because I love this. Case. And this, you know, there's kind of great work by this. So Julia Evans' book on like understanding, so you know, improving floating point literacy is it's brilliant. And like I recommend it to anyone, uh, no matter what domain they work in. Um, but why is this a problem for us? Why is it not a compiler's problem? Right? Like worrying about this stuff. Well, anyway, I'm going to stop that. Right um, so. What I'm going to wrap up with is, I mean, hopefully I've convinced you that trying to do this work is fraught with problems that stem from the kind of tools that, that these people uh, have to work with, or kind of computer systems not kind of going far enough in their support. At least that's how I take all of this. That's you know, your great interpretation, I guess. Um, this last picture is just like here are, here are four things that I kind of built over the last year to try to fix some of these, and some of them worked and some of them didn't. They're all minor, this isn't like grand, none of these are groundbreaking, but I think it's interesting seeing which ones worked and which ones didn't. So the first one I wrote was a tool called Little John, because our server is not shit. And Little John, I wrote in my first month I was here, and it, all it does is it takes a program that you want to run, 
many times. And you give it a CSV file with the arguments for each invocation, and it just runs it in parallel up to a limit, right? It doesn't, it's not clever. It's just that you could say, please run 20 of these. I'll just keep churning through your jobs 20 at a time on this kind of big CPU. Um, this is an embarrassing success, right? It's the, it's really, I, I wrote it thinking I'd throw it away and like do some more clever stuff with the OH to add concurrency to it, but it turned out Python's really bad at concurrency. And not only did, did all the AOH stuff get done, I've seen other people using it without having spoken to me, which means that it's had some kind of success beyond its immediate use, uh, which I see that both, you know, I feel somewhat affronted by. I mean, it's good that it's helping them, but it's, 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 it's kind of terrible. But I think it's kind of like, you know, I, it's a kind of reminder that this is back to the very short paper, like, good enough, right? It's kind of like, I think, like to, to, to draw a kind of a linkage between one of these little tools I've actually, this one didn't require the ecologists to have to change what they did. They didn't require them to learn something computery, right? It was just, think what you're already doing, you already know about CSV files, and you know, and you're good, and you, then you get results faster. And sometimes they'll blow up shit with, but don't worry about that. Uh, like, cause that's the kind of, it doesn't know anything about memory. And I'd like to make it better and memory aware and it'd scale back jobs depending on how much CPU and memory there is. I've kind of done that work before in other contexts. But Linux makes it hard and expensive to do that. And actually, the kind of return on investment is, is negligible compared to once in a while and not blurring and showing. So that was one little job. That was a success. It was very limited. I didn't think it was very good, but it was actually, you know, a success. Um, there's a series of articles by Richard P. Gabriel about the trade-off between doing the right thing in terms of design of APIs and systems, like where you make them perfect, but then they're constrained, but they do everything well. Um, and um, the kind of uh, worse is better philosophy, which is this is a grubby, grotty interface, but if, if you have your beaten track, you can do everything you want, right? And I kind of was interested in the kind of doing the right thing. And so I made this tool called Yoke Shepherd, which the making GDAL bit is kind of a bit dated, it's done more than that now. But the idea was that you could take geospatial data sets and treat them like in um, data frames and pandas. So like you wouldn't worry about the pixel anymore, you'd worry about the map, right? I'm going to operate at a higher level, I can express my computation more succinctly. Um, I'm terrible. Uh, doing all of the offsets, like when I'm doing maps, like my map starts at this coordinate, I'm trying to do this frame here, so I need to remember, to, I can't do all that in my head, so you have to check it with a place for dumping that. And it also does memory management. So those 150 gigabyte maps, actually you can scale up thousands of speeches with your check because it worries about how much memory is using and only swaps in limited amounts of data. So it, it, it's trying to do the good thing. And this, you know, it lets you take like sprawling code you can't read and make it smaller code you can't read. Um, but like at the bottom, you can see there's like results called land times filtered L's time mass. That's those are really all maps, right? And you express your operation for the AOH count at a higher level. Um, no one uses it other than me. Um, uh, I use it extensively all the time, but ultimately, I'm really the only audience for it. And I think that because it required learning originally, right? Even though the API is notionally better than the original subjective, but I would argue it's better than using GDAL directly, getting the ecologist to stop, learn a new tool, and understand the semantics was not something they were interested in doing. I have time to do, right? It's okay. I'm making them work for the improvement rather than just making things better for them. So, whereas this I love is not used, and you know, the little job I hate is used, right? Um, uh, SSR. Uh, this is a middling one. That's the emoji. Um, <laughs> FSR was a, a attempt to solve the GDAL problem, like with different versions of GDAL. Also, GDAL is such a pain in the neck to install reliably. Like the number of people I've had to help because they've done pip install GDAL and it's just says, uh, I don't understand not part. Um, and then, like, I think back about a year ago, the GDAL people pushed a wrong, a buggy version into pip. And if that was in your pit cache, you would just screw it after that. 
Um, so FSR uses containers, like uses Docker style containers behind the scenes, but doesn't burden the user with knowing that. So on all of our machines, you can type arc Python 3, and it runs, it looks like Python, it just looks like you type Python 3, but it's running in a container that has all of the G download and all the geospatial libraries preloaded. And you don't need to worry about a pip environment. You don't need to worry about compatibility. You know it's on a specific version of GDAP, and it hides all of that. And this is being used, right? So this is again, it's a, it's a not that exciting. It's not rocket science, but because I, I think because again, it isn't a burden on the user. People have been using this because even though it's like slightly weird quirky thing, Michael wrote the alternative is GDAP errors, um, and so that's that's been. Uh, some somewhat of a success. And then my favorite. Um, so the final one, and, and then I promise I'll, I'll draw, draw this to a, to a, to a conclusion ish. Um, I wrote this after my space looked like that, after people kept asking me to find where scripts were on show as I was saying earlier. Um, like having spelunked people's home directories is enough times. So what PyTrack is, is an attempt to do a bodge, a thing that I would love to have done. I spent most of last year saying, I know what I want to do, I want to do this. I want to take containers and like do some tracing on the inputs and outputs of the containers so I can help build up a graph of what went into a computation. And so we can start to get some of that reproducible results goodness, right? And it's, I don't have the time to do it properly. And so I kept putting it off because I wanted to do it properly. <clears throat> But then this is just as I was answering this, like, I can do something here. Uh, so PyShark is a tool, like you just this is all you do, you just do it for PyShark. And what it does is it just hooks the hell out of all of your libraries. So it looks for GDAL, if it finds GDAL, it, it hooks the open and, and um, non existing closed functions, um, and similarly for NumPy and Pandas. It knows about Python multipressing, so it does a bunch of trickery around that. And every time you open a file or write a file, it starts putting in metadata for you without you having to do it. So that um, um, what you see here is I, I've like ran this computation. I've got like two commands here, um, and then if you look at the file, there's a there's some extra metadata that's hidden behind the Michael talking thing, which I can't move. You just have to pick my word for things. Um, and in that metadata is this JSON blob. And from that JSON blob, I can get, I can say this file at the end, which is the um, the, the resulting tip. The metadata says what program was ran to generate it. It says what the inputs were to that script. Inside it is also like a pip environment, like taken to generate it. And if those files have that metadata, which these downloads did, I can work out how those were generated. And so I can just examine this one file. And I know what version of the script was it, what Git repository it is, what machine they ran it on, whether it had AMD bugs or not. Um, and you can imagine, like in my mind, what you do is like when you update, when you upload this result to um, Zenodo, say, this would go with it. And again, you start to have this kind of fully traceable world. Um, and like when these files, the inputs are being pulled from Zenodo, you can imagine pulling in that and helping it to. The idea is that the final artifact of the research has the um, provenance built into it. It's all a hook and all a uh, kind of hack that, at the moment, but it's it's good enough that it solves a problem. And so I kind of think looking forward is kind of like, you know, I keep talking about this idea of replayable shell, which is taking that kind of container where you've got a constrained environment, like I know what the environment is in that container because it comes from a Docker file. So there's a manifest, you know what versions were into that. We've got something like PyShark where we can start tracing your inputs and outputs. And we can start saying, not only is here what went into this result, but actually we can generate a main file. Like, like if all the Git repositories are there, like we can just say, you want to try this for yourself? Just here, just we'll automatically generate a uh, shell script make file, whatever to run it. Or you want to try it with variants, mm -hmm. like you can just swap out one of the files to rerun it. But I feel we've got lots of little bits here that we've been able to pull together to do this. And there's probably lots of other stuff you could kind of you would love to do around it. But I think kind of like the, my my learning is what can I do that's not gonna 
a burden on the ecologist because they have enough to worry about, whilst uh, also not being expensive <laughs> to prototype until we work out if it's good enough. So that's kind of where, where this is all going, trying to like, how can I automate all of these, these this problem with uh, tracing what happened. Thanks a lot. Um, The, the, the bad joke is that that is the number of lots, which was at the time I took that vote for the biggest competition in the world. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. thanks for questions. Um, yeah. So, um, uh, I have a question, something. Have you considered um, using compression um, to address the uh, data storage issue with both versioning? And also the large memory requirements uh, for, for processing. So you can compress in memory. Oh, I mean, I think that that'll get you so far. But if you think about um, that AOH how we set down like in theory, it'd be like petabytes of memory if you were to try and learn everything you could possibly want to do at once. So I think. Uh, I mean, yeah, I think it would be a good kind of incremental improvement if you could do something like that, but it's not going to, like, it's not changing, like, you'll still have that problem eventually, it's not eradicating it, so I think having systems that are able to be more cleverer and help do the tasks that otherwise we expect the user to do is, is what's needed. Is that... Yeah, that makes sense. And also, um, is... Uh... The different versions of the like the tips, for example, mm -hmm. um, do they store the deltas between them? Because that's quite an easy way to just reduce the. No, no. I mean, they this for the for the IRC stuff. They only publish the current year. Um, um, like again, you know, tools like that might help. But again, you've then got pens. Who then is reassembling them? Like at the moment, I would settle for just telling me that it's changed. <laughs> which is kind of like a first tier problem. Like there's like Jedi data has a kind of similar thing that they version it and they update the analysis and they you know they'll publish a new version of the Jedi this is satellite data. But they at least tell you like the ex explicitly version it's very obvious when 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 you're changing. At least I think think so. Right? Um that even though it's frustrating that they are not get the old data to 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 uh reproduce early results at least I'm aware I have a problem and I think that's more sure. I don't see. thank you cool. this might be a kind of more of a question for you and um, I guess I'm I mean I'm interested in your you know your frustration that you feel like the you know the vernacular um developers the ecologists they're just trying to do their job mm -hmm. and you feel like the computer scientists have made it hard for them. But I'm, and, and you know, fair enough, I understand that. But I'm kind of thinking, is it, it's not just about building things that make it easier for the ecologists to do their job, but also about maybe kind of shaping the way that they do what they do. I mean, there's things like version control and stuff. I mean, these just seem like, discipline sort of issues about how you handle data and how you manage it and how you make that transparent so that you don't end up with the kind of problem with at least it's gone on maternity leave and I don't know what she did, she just did some stuff and I've just got to go and rummage around and see if I can figure out what that was. If you had a system that imposed some discipline on the way that you did that so that it, it did kind of shape people's practice a bit more in... Does, does that make sense? Yeah, so yeah, like it's not. It's not that, obviously they're they're just doing things in order to get things done, and that's fine, and it ought to be easier than it is. But some of what needs to change is a kind of a, a cultural shift or a, a slight change in the way the discipline works to take account of these data management needs, which kind of hasn't happened because it hasn't been people's primary focus. It's just like a thing you you know have to get through. Yeah. It, it kind of needs to be incorporated more in the way that people do their work, and so you therefore need to design the tools in a way that encourages people to do that and makes it easier for people to do it. Yeah, no, I, 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 I don't disagree that there is, there is also a you know, uh, reframing of, of how the computer side of science is approached. 
I chatted, I had a great discussion with the interaction provider for Christmas. And she worked uh, in the building industry and like they, you know, how they review and assess the environment would tend to their work. And ultimately she said, like, I was, she said, I was excited to say, hi, these are people, like, how, how do I make it obvious that this file, this really big file that you can't do this has changed? Like, how many ways are you on? And she was like, no, you step back. Like, you've got a problem with both your pay grade, like, some degree, right? It's, it's an institutional problem with how, 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 like, the, the staffing of these projects is approached as well, right? And then it's, um, and, and I think your, 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 your fits into that framing as well, right? It's, it's like, how do we set up the processes and systems? Like, you could say, pay people require not just the data that they require. Um, and, you know, a paper bill of materials for the data as well. Um, and so I think there is that, and that, that that is, I think, something interesting, but it's also, I'm less effective than that. So a lot of this is through the lens of what Michael can try and change. Um, but I don't screw with your point. I yeah, to... I mean, I like to see the two kind of come together, not just, oh, we have to change people's yeah. practices, because the way you change people's practices obviously has to work with the technology, so you kind of have to do those. In a I think also the inverse is true, right? The, the, the technology has to work with people's practices. I don't, yeah. I don't think we can go to the ecologist and say, you've got to change how you do it to suit our uh, arcane methods. No, and, no, and, no. And I guess, yeah, maybe meeting in the middle is a better, um, better point. I mean, it. Yeah, I guess, well, I don't really have a question. I've always enjoyed hearing your reflections on this sort of thing. I think they're very like insightful and thoughtful and I, it was great talk. I, um, I guess to your point a little bit, I, I think about how like, I, you know, my background is in software engineering and I worked as a site reliability engineer at Google. So that was like, where it was all about good programming practices and reliability engineering in particular is about making sure that the, the whole idea is like people make mistakes and you you can't engineer away from like like an incremental change. So if you don't make it impossible to make a mistake, mistakes will happen. And so it doesn't it doesn't work to start thinking about how can I make people better at not making mistakes. You have to think about how can I make the system such that the mistake couldn't have been made in the first place. Um, and I came into writing ecology programs with that in mind. And I have to say, I have such a hard time doing the right thing. Like, I think it, the tooling really isn't built for, you know, simple things like you you're going to have these long pipelines with large intermediate data steps that just cannot, you cannot run them end to end every single time. It's a waste of time. But you're going to make a small change to one part of the pipeline and you're going to rerun the results between step four and step five and then regenerate the downstream data. And that is such a common paradigm. And so little of our tooling allows you to see that that change happened and how it affected the downstream results, except for naming your files like Jedi degradation underscore 2022 underscore two by two plots underscore control underscore no deforestation included. Like that's it. That's all like that's that's what you got, you know? And I think like that, like thinking that through from a computer science perspective, I, I guess if I have a question from this, it's like, what do because some of this, I think, isn't always acknowledged in computer science research. Like, what do we do to make this something that computer scientists want to dedicate their time to, to easing this path forward? Yeah, I mean, I think it is, like, again, I read it, I tend to be told this from a systems kind of bottom-up approach. I think it is interdisciplinary within our discipline. Like, it does need user kind of proper user and sort of experience analysis, like watching people working out those pain points, right? Because the ecologists don't know that they should complain about it because it's always been thus. You at least have the benefit of having worked in other systems with those kind of tools and said, wait a minute, this is efficient, right? And I think trying to trying to capture that. I don't know. I mean the the, the, the kind of the, the motivations of I think that's going to be interesting tomorrow, Proffle, right? Because that's because so this program we're just going to going tomorrow is because it's this program for planet track. And you know, it's kind of kind of how do you engage those people to do not just what they were going to do anyway, just put a different hat on, 
on it, but actually get them to get work out how to bridge that gap between the actual pain that's stopping people saving the planet and clearing it out. I don't, I don't know. I mean, even if I can sort of jump in over here. This reminds me of sort of the interactive versus batch in big, you know, in, in uh, database programs that people talk about, right? The interactive stuff with many great queries, just exploratory. I think we talked about this flexible, being, being flexible of what you're going to do. And once you've got that, then you want the batch, which is the big jobs. And I think what you're talking about is that the programming paradigms uh, in uh, typical software engineering don't mirror what people do for their business data processing, which is really what you're doing over here. Like the, the data processing rather than programming uh, or typical programming per se. And the data processing people, the management information science people, they worry about this a lot because this is very interesting. This is payroll, this is taxes, this is you know, all the big stuff that we care about. And they have the same precise properties of very large data sets. Everything has got to be just right reproducible, all those good things, right? So in some sense, maybe the, uh, the paradigm we're using of, of uh, computer science is the wrong one. Maybe she's using management information science as the right paradigm and look into what people do for uh, what the IRS does, so the equivalent to IRS, the HMRC does for, for taxes, because that's really what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, and Patrick found this great quote in a paper about how a lot of data practices that the scientists do uh, wouldn't pass muster in a wet lab, right? Where they, 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 they would approach it with much more kind of documentation and kind of uh, more ethics. I guess the costs of failure are much higher, obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not like, again, in the domains that they're, they're using that. So, you know, that, you know it's, it's, again, it's how much of that is. Um, Computers are just seen as other, and that's why it's not applied. Or it's just because the, we don't have the affordances that you know. In a wet lab, I imagine things will have labels on them, and you'll be able to record what you've done. It's just been set up that way. Right? I suspect not. I mean, if that happened, we wouldn't have an instrument today. <laughs> oh, right. So you're saying it's, it's actually it's a feature, not bug. <laughs> yeah, that's why it's called experiments. You don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. I think there is a lot of. Uh, a lot of ex literally experimentation at once, but then experimentation is different from big pharma, where everything is. That's the flexibility to do the access. Yeah. And, yeah, that's the, that's what we were talking about earlier, right? It's yeah. the, the challenge of letting them also experiment. And like, I'm always applying kind of end shipping product rigor. How do you, but a lot of what I've learned is too that what these guys do isn't understood to start with. It's not like the world I'm used to, where you have a specification vaguely and you try and implement it. They're just learning as they go. And a lot of the tools that we assume also don't work in that model. I, I think, you know, well, I, I think you're running out of time, but I just want to say, while you said several times, oh, we computer scientists are failed ecologists, I think it's also true that these problem sizes are atypical of what we do, you know, in a single system anyway. You know, when we have these massive problems, our usual approach is to go to a distributed, you know, cluster type approach and break it up into smaller pieces so that we can do that. And we deliberately chose not to do that because those have their own overhead and their own issues of management. I mean, uh, if, if you went to if you went to Google and said we'd like to solve this very large problem, forty thousand species under T, they would they would laugh if we said it's being on a single server, right? The, the, uh, the immediate thing would be to put it and do some kind of a Spark or, or, or a map reduce type system and say, okay, how do you break it up? So we sort of tied our hands to single server. Uh, so tied our hands by using single server. So I think that's part of it. But yes, the rounding errors and things like that certainly yeah. that doesn't help. Um, it's Patrick, and I, I think we're out of time. But... Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. It was great. Um, I think like, one thing that um, maybe wasn't touched on as much is kind of um, how we can maybe improve the communication between kind of interests like ecologists and computer scientists, because I think some of the problems are by nature just um, intractable, even with all the right tools in place. You know, we have the best things possible. There's still just problems that are like you need to spend the last 10 years writing really optimal Python code because this thing is huge and the floating point numbers are um, all over the place and we need to just manage it in a way that only perhaps someone, a uh, software engineer or computer scientist has, but then kind of how do you communicate that with ecologists in the right way? Um, 
part of the they know that that's a problem that they need to kind of ask your scientists to solve. Uh, another one is just with the two examples that you give and with my own experience being involved in some of them is it's kind of how do we, you know, do you think there's um, also ways to improve um, communicating scientific methodologies to computer scientists and having that back and forth conversation? Because I know for us, uh, at least for the Tropical Most Forest Fund, like that was a big game point that it like, cost us a lot of time, a lot of compute, a lot of memory, uh, a lot of headaches. Um, and maybe some of those things would have helped um, make the whole process easier. Yeah, I, mean, I think knowing that you have to have that conversation. This is kind of like the meta problem, right? So, but I think you're absolutely right that the uh, kind of trying to work out how to bridge those gaps. Well, there you go. I think it's it's um, uh, some degree. I, I hope some of the problems we could have up technically, but I think yes, you're right. The, the, the kind of communication, the finding a a way to have people express these problems without understanding computer architecture. I would say it would be good. Yeah. Okay, I think we really do need to stop. But you know where to find Michael. So thank you so much.